Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, my name is Jerry Brito, and I am the Executive Director of Coin Center, an independent nonprofit research and advocacy center that's focused on the public policy issues facing cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Our mission is to be a resource to policymakers and members of the media who want to learn more about digital currency technology and to develop legal research that meets the policy challenges this technology presents. So I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing. I would like to provide some background on the technology we are discussing. I'd also uh, be happy to answer any technical questions uh, that you might have or to explain some of the regulatory activity that we've seen to date. Now, digital currencies are nothing new. They have existed for decades, from Microsoft Points to Facebook Credits to Airline Miles, and neither are online payment systems new. PayPal, Visa, Western Union Pay, these are all examples. So what is it about Bitcoin and similar crypto, crypto, uh, cryptography-based currencies that make them unique? Bitcoin is the world's first completely decentralized digital currency, and it's the decentralized part that makes it unique. Decentralized means that there is no issuer, no central authority, uh, and there is no company, no building, no server. Before the invention of Bitcoin, for two parties to transact online, to transact electronically, always required a trusted third party someone like PayPal or Bank of America. And why was that? Well, what would an online transaction have looked like without uh, a trusted intermediary? Let's think first about a cash transaction where no third party is needed. If I hand you a $100 bill, you now have it and now I don't. And we can verify that tran the transaction has taken place by looking at our hands. If we try to do that online, what would that look like? Well, we'd have to represent the $100 bill digitally and we'd have to basically create a $100 digital file, and I would attach that $100 file to a message, much like I might attach a photo or Word document uh, to an email, and I would send it to you. You would then have the $100 file, but what about me? When I email a Word document to you, is a document deleted from my computer? No, I retain a perfect digital copy. So if it was a $100 file, I'd retain a perfect digital copy of that same $100 bill, and I could send it to a second person, or a third person, or a fourth. This is what computer scientists called the double spending problem. And we solved that problem by employing trusted third parties, like PayPal. When I send you a $100 bill using, or sorry, $100 using PayPal, I don't communicate directly with you. Instead, I ask PayPal to deduct that amount from my balance on their ledger and add it to yours. This means, however, that we must each have an account with the same party that we trust. Bitcoin's invention is revolutionary because for the first time, the double spending problem can be solved without the need for a third party. Bitcoin does this by distributing the necessary ledger among all the users of the system via a peer-to-peer -peer network. Every transaction that occurs in the Bitcoin network is registered in a distributed public ledger, which is called the blockchain. The global peer-to-peer -peer network, composed of thousands of peers, takes the place of the intermediary. You and I can now transact online without an intermediary. Now, why would one use Bitcoin instead of a traditional payment system? There are many reasons uh, but chief among them is because there, if there's no intermediary, transactions costs can be lower, uh, making Bitcoin transactions cheaper and faster than some existing systems. And perhaps more importantly, though, Bitcoin allows for new kinds of transactions that were never before feasible, including microtransactions, self-executing contracts, and other innovations. Bitcoin is an open network protocol. This means that unlike PayPal or a credit card network, you don't need permission to join and transact. As a result, Bitcoin is an open platform for innovation just like the internet itself. In fact, Bitcoin looks today very much like the internet did in 1995. So uh, some dismissed the internet then as a curiosity, but many could see that such an open platform for innovation would allow for world-changing applications to be built on top of it. Few in 1995 could have foreseen Facebook or Skype or Netflix, but they could see that all the building blocks were there for some amazing innovations. Bitcoin is like that today. We can't conceive yet what will be the killer applications on Bitcoin, and open uh, cryptocurrencies, but it's pretty ob obvious that they will come. Bitcoin faces some challenges, however, and chief among them is regulatory uncertainty, especially at the state level. If we think back again to the early internet, it was not until the government made it clear that it would pursue a light touch regulatory approach that internet innovation really took off. Bitcoin today is in need of similar commitment from government. Therefore, as you consider regulatory policies that affect this infant technology, you should take care to measure their impact on continued innovation. If you need any further assistance as you consider digital currencies, please do not hesitate to contact us at Coin Center. Again, our mission is to build a better understanding of these technologies and to promote a regulatory climate that preserves the freedom to innovate using blockchain technologies. 
we are more than happy to connect you with the appropriate academics, experts, and practitioners in this space. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Sure. Um, one thing to keep in mind about ransomware, which is a very serious problem, is that it predates Bitcoin and decentralized digital currencies. We've seen ransomware as far back as 20 years. And what makes ransomware possible today is three things. It is uh, a breach of a computer. Essentially, you get hacked. Uh, number two, cryptography. Essentially, your files on your computer are encrypted, so you have no longer have access to them. And number three, it's a payment method. So in this case, it's Bitcoin, where you can pay the person using ransom. Of those three things that are necessary for, um, for ransomware, encryption and digital currencies um, have incredible potential you know, good uses, right? So in cryptography is what keeps our bank balances safe. Digital currencies, we've talked what they make a lot possible. Um, the third component, though, the breach, the hack, mm -hmm. the lack of cybersecurity, that's where the real uh, concern is. And I'm happy to say that in conjunction with the CDC, Coin Center, and a lot of the companies in this space have created something called the Blockchain Alliance, uh, which is a public-private forum uh, between law enforcement and the companies in the space to begin to discuss and educate law enforcement about how they can do this kind of tracking to reach, you know, get the bad guys. Are there places a criminal can go, countries to which they can go, where these traceability aspects are muted or, or disrupted? So the traceability of the coins, as it were, on the network cannot be compromised. You can still trace the coins. The problem is that the uh, off-ramp and on-ramp may be in a country that is not um, uh, cooperating with law enforcement in other countries. But that, again, is an issue not of Bitcoin. It's an issue of cooperation between law enforcement. Address that. Well, I yes, would like please. We'll go here, down here. Sure. Thank you. I would add that um, to date we have not seen terrorist financing using digital currency although it absolutely is a possibility. Um, what we see instead is the use of prepaid cards and other uh, centralized methods that can truly uh, guarantee anonymity. And we see the director of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the Treasury Department uh, testify um, before Congress when on in a hearing about digital currency that cash is still the number one way um, that uh, folks money launder money and uh, conduct uh, uh, terrorist financing. I could cool. uh, just go down the panel and, and ask for your thoughts on what is going to be the what's going to be the game changer that consumers see? What application of the blockchain technology, Mr. Brito? We'll start with you, and then we'll just work down the line. Sure. Um, I think if I knew, I would be out building it and making a fortune. Um, uh, so, it, wait a I, minute. Wait, you're not suggesting this isn't a productive use of your time, <laughs> no, being in front of the United States <laughs> Congress? <Come on. laughs> this um, is where I live my life. Please proceed. <laughs> Uh, that said, uh, you know, with, as with the early internet, I think the killer applications are going to come from left field. It's going to be things that we can't expect. But if I had to take a guess today, I would say it's going to be in areas where technology excels and does things that our current payment system and our current um, uh, 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 sort of asset systems do not do. And to me, those are microtransactions and macrotransactions. So the ability to have very, very small payments that today our existing payment systems do not uh, allow it to be efficient or economic. Imagine, you know, if you think about the web, the business model of the web is essentially either charging you a monthly big fee for video, for audio, for articles, or showing you advertising. And the only reason we have th that choice of business models is because we can't pay directly a few pennies for this one article or, these, or this five minutes of audio. Um, this technology for the first time makes it possible. The other is macro transactions, really big um, uh, border uh, cross-border payments uh, that today are expensive and take a long time because of the, the, the expense and inefficiency in the corresponding banking system. Freeman, Thank you. 